Hello, everybody who's joining us live. I am so excited to be here with my friend, Dr. Christine Marin. And we are going to talk today about a topic I haven't talked about lately, but is so important. Um, we're going to talk about preconception health, which is basically how do you get your body in the best shape before you have a baby so that your baby is in the best health of your life and then your pregnancy, your post-pregnancy period and all of that goes very smoothly. And as much as we don't have control over things, this is one thing that often women do have a choice depending on their life and their you know, relationships and things, but often women do have a little window where they think about getting pregnant and we wanna to talk to you. Now, if you've already had children, I promise this will be relevant to you as well. And you are in for a treat because um, Dr. Marin is just not only a great friend, um, we have this mutual admiration society and then but also just a brilliant brilliant doctor who has really made it her life's work to help women not only with great functional medicine concepts but in the pre-pregnancy period I'm gonna read her bio and then we'll jump right in so she's a board certified physician and founder of an innovative virtual functional medicine practice in Colorado we're literally just down the street from each other we're very close which is fun she also does um, sees patients from Colorado Michigan and Texas She's the co-founder of Hey Mommy, a platform dedicated to helping women through the stages of motherhood. And we're going to talk about the platform, how you can get signed up, and how you can get all her latest guides. Now, you may not see that right now when you go to the website. We'll give you the link. We'll share all of that in this talk. But um, you guys are in for a treat. So you want to be sure and sign up for this because she's got, I've seen some of the back end, what's coming. And it is amazing resources. She's put so much time and energy into this. And I promise you guys, you will love this content. And if you're a grandmother or you're someone who hasn't had children yet, or you know your sister-in-law is wanting to get pregnant, you can still sign up and share this content with your uh, women friends or the male friends in your life that want to have a family as well. So just hang on and we will introduce all of that. Um, she was introduced to functional medicine after struggling with pregnancy complications and recurrent miscarriages. And I'm going to ask her to tell her story because as you know, you, I love to talk about story. Um, the functional medicine approach helped her address the underlying health issues associated with gut infections, hypothyroid, hormone imbalance, and mold toxicity, which you all know is one of my favorite topics. Now she's a mother of three, a devoted a professional, and has devoted her life to helping other moms optimize their health before pregnancy, thrive postpartum, and get their life back. She's certified by the American Board of Family Medicine and the Institute of Functional Medicine, and she's a compassionate clinician, speaker, and wellness advocate. So I am so excited to have her. So welcome, Christine. Um, Thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor. Yes, um, I am excited to have you. And just another note for you guys, if you um, know someone who might like this, be sure and share if you'd like. If you know someone would like it, you can always re-listen. This will be recorded and live. And then post your comments because I'll be watching in the background. And if we have time at the end, I'll try to be sure, as I always do, to go through and either later go through your comments or even now we'll do live Q&A with Dr. Marin today. Um, so Christine, what I love to start with is story because it drives like why we do what we do. And I'd love for you to tell everyone a little bit about your story. Yeah. So my story, I actually, you know, I was born and raised in Colorado and had a very holistic upbringing. And I went to college in Boulder and had some hormonal issues and kind of acupuncture helped me a lot. And I just was really into like a more holistic perspective. And that's kind of part of the reason I chose to go to osteopathic medical school but it really, I didn't find functional medicine until I had my own pregnancy struggles. So um, my story unfolded through pregnancy. Um, my first daughter, I had gestational diabetes, which was super weird because I had like zero traditional risk factors. And I really questioned what was going on with that. And then when I, uh, my husband and I tried to get pregnant with our second child, we had recurrent pregnancy loss. And I really knew at that point, I mean, even after the first one, I just had this very um, intuitive sense, like something is wrong. Mm -hmm. Something is really wrong with me. And of course my husband tried to reassure me, but I just knew. And, um, you know, after the second one, it was like, I, I have to figure this out. And I just, I, you know, worked with a functional medicine provider and then just delved in like head first because I knew professionally and personally my lives were colliding. And I also found my life's work in that. Um, so there was a lot of work to be done. And, um, after my second, um, my health got a lot better as I figured out a lot about my environmental exposures and my thyroid and my hormones and my gut. And I was feeling really great. And then I got pregnant like accidentally with my third um, and she's a blessing and we love her so much. But um, it was sort of a testament to like, as you get your health back, you get your fertility back. 
Uh, so that happened and now I have three. So I love working with women just kind of going through those same phases, whether they're trying to get pregnant and struggling or maybe not, maybe you're just, you know, want to optimize their health because there's so much opportunity there to have a better pregnancy. So what I went through with my second, um, I wish I knew what I know now because it would have been a lot less painful. And I think I would have had a healthier kid too. Yeah, Obviously. Right. <laughs> right. Right. It's so interesting how, um, you know, one thing, one reason I really wanted to talk to you and many of my um, audience knows I'm writing a book now. So I've been diving into like my history and even preconception because I got cancer at 25 and looking back at the, um, my youth and my zero to five years old, I was vaginal born and breastfed, but my mother, I think in hindsight was probably quite toxic and didn't know it. And some of those toxins were endocrine disruptors like atrazine and other organophosphate chemicals that are used on a farm. And now looking back, there's no doubt, not that, that, not that those caused my cancer, but there's definitely a likely contribution from the in utero exposure for someone that young in her 20s to get cancer. I really think it was related to my mother's health during pregnancy in some ways. So it's fascinating to me. And then I know some of your story with, um, tell us just a little bit about the mold exposure and when that happened and how, because I see so many women who have miscarriages in a moldy home. Yeah. And I think it's important for especially my audience to hear this because you don't think of that as a cause. Totally. Yep. Totally. Um, yeah. So it, in my case, uh, I had lived in a couple of different places because my husband was military and we moved around and, um, we remodeled a bathroom and just had like a massive, I had a massive mold exposure, which at that time, unfortunately, I didn't realize like, oh, when you knock down a wall and you find mold, like run the other direction, cover everything up, call them like mold remediation team immediately. And instead I was like in the bathroom amongst all this mold. And uh, I just, I think I had a really bad hit, you know? And I mean, like in retrospect, you think, well, what other homes have you had where there's potential mold? I mean, it's so common, right? So yeah. I don't know, maybe there was mold exposure prior to that. Even as a kid, my house caught on fire when I was little. Wow. Yeah, you yeah. know, same thing. And again, I grew up in this old farmstead that had probably, you know, I remember there being part of the basement that was still dirt. Like there was cellar, yeah. floor, like a real cellar. And I'm like, oh my gosh, there had to be so much mold growing up. And then totally. you know, what people don't know in the grain. So I grew up on a farm that had grains of corn and soybean. And in those bins where they store them, it is loaded with mold. Like it's yeah. known the fungal content is actually measured when they take it to market. I didn't know any of this growing up, but I had probably massive mold exposure. I mean, a, isn't it interesting to look at those silos and you're like, of course they're full of mold. Yeah. Like, and we have all these research studies looking at cattle who are harmed obviously from the mycotoxins in their food. But of course that thing is full of mold. It's like dark and moist and we pile a bunch of grains in there and it gets hot and then it gets cold. And it's like, and it's like this baking. So yeah. I grew up on a farm with the, with the grain bins on the farm and there's these aluminum silos that are just baking in the heat. Yes. And totally. the moisture, so the corn, when it comes mm -hmm. out of the field is usually somewhat of a moderately high moisture content. So it's sitting in moisture and they actually have to dry it out before they sell it. I, again, yeah. I don't know all the process, but it's fascinating. Now yeah. something, I don't often screen share, but I think it's worth Christine really quickly. I'm going to try to share my screen because I pulled up right before we were talking about mold and miscarriage. And I want people to actually see the data. I'm going to share my screen really quickly and then we'll, um, get away from this. But if you can see this, so look at this. This is from Animal Studies. It's a presentation I heard recently on the effects of mycotoxins. And you can see this T2, all the different effects, the ergos, et cetera. But look at this, this Zen, which stands for something that Christine were hilariously trying to pronounce before this came on. It's called a uh, Zerolonone, I think. <laughs> Just say it really fast. Yeah, say it really fast. But that one, this Z-E-N stands for, so look, irregular heats, which means like in, um, irregular cycles. This would be for a human equivalent. Irregular menses or irregular periods. Low conception rates. Ovarian cysts, which would be like the um, women with PCOS or frequent ovarian cysts. Ironically, Christine, you know, my family grew, grew up on a farm. Still, my nieces and nephews over, over there. And there's two of my nieces that are struggling with PCOS. One of them just had an ovarian cyst issue. So this is very, very, very real with the young women in the environment where I grew up. And then look at this, abortions, which is you know miscarriages for animals. And because there's such a financial gain from them you know, having healthy cows and pigs and everything going to market and not having miscarriages, um, 
this is a big area of research in animals and we have so much data on the mold in, in the grains and the foods that they eat and the outcomes like this. It's funny because there's not nearly as many human studies on miscarriage and mold, but it's clearly, like yeah. I see this toxin in people's urine and I have two close friends, both professionals that have had moldy homes unbeknownst to them. One has had one miscarriage, the other has had three. So this is so common. So yeah. I guess I'll just say, if you're listening and you have had unexplained miscarriage and you've done a complete workup, think about mold as a possibility because nobody's talking about that, right? Yep, totally. And the other thing on that slide you just shared talked about sperm production, yeah. which I haven't seen. So I need to look that research study up, but it's so interesting to look to Like there's also this huge male component that often gets ignored, right? Absolutely. So um, again, you probably haven't heard that anywhere else, but from the mold docs here, <laughs> you you heard it first here. Um, so story, loved your story of how you've gotten into it. Um, let's talk just a little bit about like, if someone is wanting to get pregnant, what would be the basic steps? Like how would you take someone through when you see them nutritionally supplements? Let's go through a little bit of a basic overview of what you would do with them. Yeah, so I mean, as a functional medicine doctor, I like to test, don't guess, right? Like I really, <laughs> I like to get data. Um, so I like to look at nutrients, you know, I, in my, all my patients for the most part, I'll do nutrient testing. A lot of my patients, I'll do organic acid testing. I mean, you know, most of them. And of course, you know, much of our focus is often on the gut. There's a lot of, um, when it comes to fertility and gut health, you know, it's not like a straight line, but you know, there's a lot to that and gut health obviously influences your nutrient absorption. It influences inflammation, things like that. So I focus on gut health a lot, nutrient status. I like to look at nutrigenomics as well. So a lot of people have heard of MTHFR, but you know, just there's many other genes that can help us understand somebody's nutritional needs before they get pregnant. So some of these needs uh, reflect the their ability to convert beta carotene to vitamin A. You know, vitamin A as a supplement isn't safe to take during pregnancy in high doses, but sometimes we need more of it, and so there's good nutritional sources we might want to know about ahead of time. Um, of course, folate is huge, right? So we know folate is important for neural tube defects. Um, and that's been long accepted. But the other one that we miss out on is choline. And so I do some of that nutrigenomics testing. Um, there's a gene called PEMT, which can influence how much choline somebody needs. And so preconception choline is probably just as important as folate. And so just kind of looking at different food sources or supplemental sources of that. Um, I'll, let, I'll look at hormones a lot. So I'd like to do a dried urine test for complete hormones, look for signs of progesterone deficiencies or HPA axis dysfunction, things like that. Um, so, you know, and it depends, right? It depends on the patient and their history and their, you know, what they're struggling with, but environmental concerns are always at the top of my list as well. There's no better time to get rid of environmental toxins than before you bring a baby into the world. So. I love that you mentioned that because of course I love to talk about environmental toxic load and all of that. And I've gotten a lot of patients that ask this and I love your take on it. And it's, you know, say you do know you have say mercury toxicity as a woman who's going to get pregnant or mold toxicity or other chemical toxicity. Mm -hmm. We know that one of the primary mechanisms that women get rid of toxicity is through the breast milk. I mean, the studies have shown the high exactly. levels, right? And it's a really difficult conundrum. I know what I think, but I'd love to hear your opinion of, you know, what do you do if you know you have somewhat of a toxic load and at least average, which is most of us, and you want to breastfeed, what do you think, what would you counsel your women to do with yeah. that? Yeah. I mean, ideally if somebody, it, everybody's timeline is different, but ideally if we can start a detox program six months before you even try to get pregnant, that's my ideal, at least three months. I mean, if, if you're like actively trying and that's not going to change, just leave the toxins where they are, you know, like don't upregulate any detoxification, but yeah, I mean, ideally, if you know there's a toxic burden and you have chemical sensitivity or autoimmunity or something like that, it's ideal to, to do that. Because as you mentioned, like, obviously, you, you pass those toxins onto your baby. There's studies looking at cord blood, you know, of, of newborns and their toxic load is astronomical already, which is... Yeah. you know, a little bit scary and sad, but, but then the breast milk. Um, I, I love that you mentioned that because we detox through our, our stool, our bladder, our sweat and our breast milk. Yeah. So it's a big deal. Yeah, no, I, I love that. That's exactly how I feel like if we could, that's why this, this even zoom call and Facebook live is so important because if you're listening and you're even thinking you might want to get pregnant in the next five years, 
um, it's relevant because um, the more you can do detox work or see a functional provider like Dr. Marin or myself um, before you ever get pregnant, the better off you will be. And then like she said, I would always be cautious if someone is actively trying to get pregnant or just thinking in the next six months, I would not use that as a time to do a massive detox because that's going to still trickle on in, especially if they happen to get pregnant before they think, you know, four months or two months. Then as far as the breast milk thing, I really believe still our bodies are wise and that benefits of breast milk outweigh any toxicity, unless there's like some unusually high, um, extremely high level of a certain toxin that is highly excreted in breast milk. There are situations like uh, women who are on chemotherapy or certain agents that they're taking orally that the doctors know that it's going to go into the breast milk and they will advise pumping and dumping that breast milk so that the babies don't get that exposure. There is something to that in certain situations, but in general, I still believe, which it sounds like you do as well, Christine, that um, the benefits of breast milk outweigh the risk, even though we're toxic, right? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So um, what about nutrients? I mean, there's the classic prenatals, but people don't really know the quality and that. And what kind yeah. of would you either have them look for in their prenatal or if you have any brands or recommendations, um, what would you recommend for people yeah. if they're thinking about getting pregnant? So definitely methylfolate. Many people know this already, but if you pick up the back of a um, supplement bottle, I tell my patients, like if you pick it up and look at the back, like if you see folic acid and cyanocobalamin, just put it back down. They used the cheap stuff, move on. Um, so your first sign of a, of a supplement that's maybe good is that they used a methylated form of folate and, and like a methyl or adenosyl cobalamin. So basically those are just active forms of bees, which are more closely related to the, the bees that we eat versus just a purely synthetic form. Many of us based on our genetics can't even process the synthetic stuff. And then like there's even, you know, dihydrofolic reduct, a DHFR, so dihydrofolic reductase gene, which um, can leave you even worse off with folic acid. So it's very interesting, but you know, so methylfolate and B12, I also look for choline. So choline is a huge one and most prenatals don't even have it or they have a very little amount of it, you know, like 50 milligrams. So you're looking for like 450 milligrams around there. Sometimes you can sort of hack choline by adding trimethylglycine. And so it might be slightly lower, you know, maybe 350 if you add some trimethylglycine to it. But, um, but those are some of the big ones I look for. I personally prefer um, vitamin A as a mix of beta carotene and retinal palmitate. So some preformed vitamin A that's somewhat controversial because many people uh, will, you know, some people will recommend against that because there are studies looking at high dose vitamin A in pregnancy is not safe. Agreed. Uh, but we need some, you know, we, there, many women are deficient. I'll test vitamin A in the blood um, when I'm working with patients and I'll see that there's deficiency and there are certain genes that can influence that as well. Um, so those are some of the big ones. Um, sometimes, so for women who've had a history of gestational diabetes, carnitine can be helpful. Um, and, uh, really good fish oil, you know, something with high potency DHA. We know that omega-3 fatty acids are important for, um, not only mom's health, but also baby's health and brain development. So some of my favorite brands, so vitamin IQ is one that I love. Um, our friend Sarah Morgan, uh, mm -hmm. developed that one. So they have a whole food prenatal. That one's nice cause it's, um, I think it's just four pills a day and you can open the capsules, you know, you need to add it a high quality fish oil with that one. And I also really like, <laughs> for all you yeah. listen, I'll put a link on there. Yeah. And I also really like, um, the plus one prenatal from Metagenics. So that one has a lot of choline. It's a lot of pills. So it's a little too much and it's a little stinky. So some women, you know, especially in the first trimester, if there's aversions, um, don't love it all the time, but I do, I do really like that one. So with patients who have you know, a history of gestational diabetes and um, issues like that, I'll definitely recommend that one because it has a lot of carnitine. Yeah. Oh, this is so great because um, I don't see as many preconception as you do. So I know the basics and I know I use, there's a thorn and orthomolecular book. Yes. Yeah. Um, Thorns is good. I need to, I, I need to look at their choline. They um, don't, I just looked it up. It's not nearly as much. Okay. So like, yeah, that's exactly. I was like, whoa, this, cause that's where I've like, pull it up. And yeah. Like, ortho, I don't know. I'm curious. I like that they have a pack that has DHA in it. So if the women's like, I don't want to have all these things, they still have to take two or three pills, but mm -hmm. they're in this little packet. Yeah. Um, the Zymogens is pretty yeah. good too, but again, not enough choline. Right. I wish they right. would add more. So, I mean, even the American Medical Association has come out and said, Hey guys, you need to put more choline in your prenatals. Like, like, we know on, it, right? <laughs> you know, but it just, most companies haven't. So the plus one and the vitamin IQ are the two that have a good amount of choline. Okay. I don't honestly know of any others that have 
in the, the recommended yeah. dose of choline. Now, am I right to remember that eggs are also a good source of choline? So totally. Clean farm fresh eggs. If you don't have a vitamin with choline, you could definitely do eating your healthy breakfast of eggs. In the yes, morning. exactly. Yeah. So egg yolk is by far and away, I think our best okay. resource in the American diet for choline. Organ meats are also a great source of choline, but not a ton of people eat organ yeah. meats or want to when they're right. first <laughs> like trying to get pregnant or first trimester of pregnancy. Now that's a whole other side note, but I'm curious. Do you ever fix liver for your family? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I tried. So this is what I did. I ruined like an entire batch of bone broth because I made this delicious bone broth. And then our friend Shalise yeah. told me how to prepare it and like hide the organ meat in there. So I cooked chicken livers and then I yeah. put them in my Vitamix and blended it up with the broth. It sounds disgusting. And it is, turns out it is disgusting. Really <laughs> but it really depends on how much ratio, you know, if you just did like one chicken heart, you don't even need that much organ meat. It's really nutrient dense. You can get away with like a couple ounces. But yes. But you put like 12 chicken livers in there and it was not. So oh yeah. It was like way too many. Like you need like one chicken liver in there or something. Great. I, yeah. So I haven't gotten my family to eat. To eat them yet. What about you? I was going to say, I honestly can say I've never eaten liver. I've never eaten liver. And I'm kind of embarrassed because I recommend it to patients for, you know, low iron or yeah. any of those kinds of issues. Um, the one thing is it has nothing, no relevance, but in my brain it does. It's almost like when you want to do a fecal microbiota transplant and you want a clean stool um, donor. To me, it's the same as a clean liver. Like what liver nowadays in our environment is clean? I know. So like, <laughs> I've had like, the same, I mean, I've struggled with it for so long and it's because we're not naturopaths that we don't yeah, eat liver. Totally. You know? <laughs> it's really hard for us. So we're least, just gonna admit it. <laughs> totally, right? Yeah, and all, you're right. All my natural brother friends are like, oh, I just fried up with onions and it's great. Like, oh, it's, like, it's like coffee enemas and liver, not for the allopathic. Uh -huh. <laughs> We're working on it though. We're working we on it. We're working on the coffee enemas and all that good stuff. So, oh, the, how did our conversation go so awry? I know. <laughs> um, let's talk about thyroid because um, this yes. is- Yes. Oh, thank you. I'm yes. not an expert, but this is the one thing I've seen do magic. What do you, tell me about thyroid. Thank you for bringing that up because that's the other huge thing I focus on with preconception patients. I mean, I'm on thyroid medicine. Everybody in my family is on thyroid medicine. Like I come from a family of Hashimoto's and Graves and all the things. So- um, yeah, thyroid's a big deal. Luckily, when people are talking about fertility, we have a more narrow reference range with regard to fertility when we look at TSH. So, you know, if you look at a basic lab, TSH goes up to like four and a half, sometimes a little higher, which is like way too high. I mean, you feel, most people feel terrible with the TSH of four. Not everybody, right? But like, I felt yeah. terrible yeah. with the TSH of four. Um, so anyways, with regard to fertility, the studies would support a lower or more narrow reference range with an upper limit of normal of two and a half. And so I really, you know, work, I scrutinize people's thyroid labs really closely, but not only TSH, we look at free T4 and free T3, so, and reverse T3. So if I, you know, have a patient and maybe their free T4 looks okay, but they have a low free T3, they can still be kind of functionally hypothyroid. It's not the thyroid's fault, it's a conversion problem. And so sometimes they're under converting between T4 and T3 and their T3 will be somewhere in the twos, which can still be in the reference range, but like it's too low, right? A free T3 of 2.2 is still normal on the labs, but like, I mean, that is like bare minimum to survive if you ask me. <laughs> um, so, you know, looking at free T3 is a big deal and then reverse T3. So somebody who's making a lot of reverse T3, that's when I get really like, I just look at the big picture. Like, why are you shunting all of your resources to reverse T3, which is like the breaks. Yep. And I think of it as, you know, like from an evolutionary perspective, why do we make this thing? Because inflammation, toxins, stress, not enough calories, like all of these things we want to shut the, you know, press on the brakes and hide in our cave. Mm -hmm. And that's not going to get anybody pregnant. Yeah. So we just have to address like, what is it? Maybe it's stress. Maybe it's some other, maybe it's a problem with the gut. You know, mm -hmm. there's so many other problems that can influence that, or maybe it's a problem with the environment. Yes. Oh gosh. I think that's so important. Again, you're the expert here, not me, but I've had dabbled enough in it. I remember way back when, when I first started functional medicine and I had like a 45 year old woman, wanted hormone balance, wanted thyroid health. I'm like, okay, I can do this. We didn't talk about babies. She's 45. She thinks she can't get pregnant anymore. And I fixed her thyroid, fixed her hormones. She came back a few months later and she was pregnant with twins. And yeah. it's so funny because like now literally I, I get Christmas cards from her every year because she has these amazing twins that she was never expecting, no. surprise babies. And she's so happy. But I remember at the time she was 
angry. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say another word, but, but she was so mad. You know, just the, the first thought of it was like 45. I've got twins. What am I going to do with my life? Uh-huh. Turned out to be the best thing. And she's so happy. And she, she still loves me since Christmas cards to this day. But my lesson was, wow, you've got to know where women are because often they will think they can't get pregnant and they'll be in their late thirties or forties, or they've never used birth control and they've never been able to get pregnant. And you start to like, again, I was not like, thinking about conception at all. I was thinking about just overall health. But the beautiful thing is when we treat mold toxicity, we treat environmental toxicity, we treat thyroid, we treat, treat hormones. Of course, the body wants to get pregnant. We're made to conceive if we're in a relationship and having intercourse. So um, this was, it was funny because it shouldn't have surprised me, but I remember being like, I still remember her in my early days as being such a shock. Um, because we weren't expecting that, but it's yeah. beautiful. That- yeah, I have a patient like that as well. And she was actually on low dose naltrexone. So now when I give people low dose naltrexone, I'm like, careful, because it might yeah. improve your fertility. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And that might be a great thing, but that might not be what you desire, right? right. So Absolutely. Um, you know, we didn't have the, this on our list to talk about, but I always like to mention it. And I'd love any insight you have. Do you think there's anything to do? I mean, what would you say? Is there emotional work that needs to be done? Or is there like what kind of like mind, body, spirit pieces have to do with conception? Is there anything in particular yes. to recommend or huge? Yeah. Gosh, I don't know. I mean, in particular, like I'm trying to rack my brain about the most helpful things. I mean, I think it's just for everybody, it depends on the trauma. But I think part of stress and relationship and relationship trauma, I mean, like how many people have met somebody who's in it has like an interpersonal relationship, that's an issue, whether that's their partner or yeah. somebody else. And so I think that that can induce a lot of issues. Um, but I don't know, I don't have any like specific yeah. work I love to do, yeah. aside from, you know, just addressing that with either your therapist or right, right. just making um, you go to therapy. yoga or yes, whatever it might be. What about you? Can you think of anything? Yeah. Well, the one thing I was thinking about was just the fact that um, a lot of, you know, young couples are like, let's get, I have a dozen of these right now where they're like, okay, we're going to get pregnant the next year. And they're the type A's and they have a plan and they think this is how it's going to happen. And Mm -hmm. whenever you have a plan and you're so type A that you're that structured and controlled, it never happens according to plan. And so kind of that surrender and release. And I think it affects the cortisol axis the most. So what happens is they're, you know, under stress and they're producing too much cortisol and that can affect fertility as well. So usually it's kind of that surrender piece. And of course, with a therapist, I'm not the expert there, but getting them to kind of relax their plan and let go and surrender. And often the moment they start to surrender, it happens magically. Yeah, that's such a good point. I love that. Mm. And I do know one of my family members, I won't reveal any names, but I have a lot of sister-in-laws and she had natural pregnancy and then couldn't get pregnant for many years you know, three, four, five adopted. And then um, we did some interventions with testing and found out she was gluten intolerant and convinced her to go off gluten and immediately she got pregnant. Too. Yeah. So yes. that's four children now, but we didn't talk about that, but that's a big deal, isn't it? When someone is either celiac, obviously, because this affects immune system and immune system can affect fertility pretty dramatically. There's a lot of autoimmunity that can prevent um, you from conceiving. So if you are stuck and you haven't looked, you've looked at thyroid, you've looked at hormones, you looked at all these other, you know, traditional things and you haven't looked at autoimmunity, um, that could be your thing. And often if someone wants to get pregnant, they haven't been able to, I'll say, try going gluten-free. It won't hurt you. I don't mm-hmm. often even test. Sometimes I just say, try it. What's your thoughts on gluten as a trigger? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I, that's my personal story too, you know, like I'll kind of all around that same time frame. I went gluten-free and I mean, I think part of the reason I had a successful consumption was that, but there can be so much underlying inflammation from a food sensitivity. Yeah. Um, so I think it's important to address, but I always tell my patients, like with the exception of celiac, of course, that's an autoimmune condition, but it's like, if you're reacting to foods, they should be benign. So what's going on in your gut? So I just go back to that like gut health piece, but absolutely, yeah, removing the foods that are more inflammatory, gluten and sometimes dairy. Dairy, yeah, and sugar yeah. usually. So yeah, I sugar for sure. Yeah, gluten is the number one. If there's only one thing yeah. I can have, and we negotiate, and then the three are gluten, dairy, sugar. Yep. And if we go out to seven, it's gluten, dairy, sugar, egg, soy, corn, sugar, alcohol. Those. Uh huh. Yep. You can name those really quick. Yes. Totally. <laughs> Agreed. Well, and let's talk just a little bit about gut because I love talking about gut and this obviously affects. So when you mentioned if someone has food sensitivities, um, part of the reason for that is because you have permeability. It's like the tiles that line the gut are the grout in between them has dissolved and you have this pathway between the gut lumen and the bloodstream. And if you, every time you eat, have no grout and you're leaking contents of either bacterial coatings like lipopolysaccharides 
or um, if you're leaking corn antigens and wheat antigens and sugar antigens into the bloodstream, this creates an immune response. And what's interesting is it actually relates to the pandemic right now because the same cytokines that are stimulated by that crossover of either foods or bacteria, it's IL-6, it's TNF-alpha, and it's the same party of cytokines that happens in the viral infection that causes all this inflammation in the body and lung damage. So this is like a systemic trigger and it can happen in the brain from leaky brain. It can happen in the gut, but this systemic inflammatory response, even if you don't have autoimmunity in the face of leaky gut is a trigger for things to happen, like not getting pregnant or having miscarriages or depression, anxiety, insomnia, heart disease, obesity, diabetes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I even wonder, Christine, who knows, this is completely postulatory, but Back when you mentioned, did you say you had gestational diabetes with your first? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, there is a clear link between endotoxemia, which is what I'm talking about yes. now, that crossover of the bacteria into the gut due to a permeable membrane. And there's highly correlative studies showing that probably the root cause on almost all diabetes, obesity, and heart disease is related to this crossover. And so gestational diabetes is another microcosm of diabetes. And I wonder if that happens in a woman who has more permeable gut. I don't know, but mm -hmm. it makes me wonder. That's a really interesting question. I think it from a personal perspective, yes, totally. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I had, I was chasing my blood sugar for years, even when I was trying to get pregnant. Um, I would be checking my blood sugar a lot. So gestational diabetes, I learned how to check my blood sugar four times a day and I would like monitor it like a hawk. Yeah. And I ate very specific foods and was very careful because I was not going to go on medication. And then when I was trying to get pregnant and I was having the recurrent miscarriages, my blood sugar was like so wacky. And it wasn't PCOS because of course, you know, polycystic ovarian syndrome is another whole piece of infertility that can cause issues because really it's a metabolic thing, but, mm -hmm. but yeah, I was like chasing my blood sugar all over the place. And I think it was probably largely related to endotoxemia from gut issues, mm -hmm. but I see patients too, right? Where you're like, uh, your blood sugar shouldn't be this high. It's obviously, it's not insulin resistance. Right. Their insulin's totally normal, but their hemoglobin A1C is pretty high. And they're having these, you know, um, like peaks and valleys with their, with their blood sugar. And it's like, what's going on? There's this underlying sort of inflammation and cortisol or, yeah. Maybe it's a lipopolysaccharides. I don't know. But it, yeah, that's an interesting. Totally. Well, thought. and then the other thing you mentioned in your story and my story of my friends um, is the mold. And we know mold will cause a couple weird things to happen. It'll lower MSH, which MSH, when it's not present in mouse models, low MSH produces Crohn's and colitis. So massive permeability and inflammation. So you actually need MSH to have the tight junctions to have the grout. And then the other um, underlying thing that can happen in mold is this trigger of the cytokines cause leptin resistance and kind of induce a pre-diabetic blood sugar issue state. So it's interesting because maybe some of these patients too would have a little mold exposure or the um, gut leaky gut issues and they're probably all connected. <laughs> yeah, totally. All of the above with their fungal dysbiosis. Yeah. And, yeah, and yeah. Then, then there's candida. We didn't even talk about I know about this that. well. Yes. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Me too. Um, gosh. Well, and, and this is relevant because what I see is I don't, I, again, I'm not the expert preconception. I do some of that, but that's not my primary thing like Dr. Christine. But what I do see is post-pregnancy or children and parents, and I see them in the office. And what I see is very interesting. Say I see a seven-year-old kid and their mother, they often have the same patterns of dysbiosis. So if they have fungal overgrowth or Klebsiella or Streptococcus, they will often have very mirror images. And of course, if with a vaginal delivery, the mother inoculates the baby. So then the baby comes into the life with whatever flora the mother has. So what would you say to preconception with whether probiotics or other recommendations with the mother's gut health? Yeah. I mean, that's where it's, that's where I love doing organic acid testing. And I do, you know, GI map, like stool testing to see what's going on. I mean, sometimes people don't even know they have gut problems, but you know, obviously like somebody who has digestive symptoms, somebody who has food sensitivity, somebody who has autoimmunity, I know there's something going on with the gut. And we know by addressing that you'll have better fertility, but better pregnancy outcomes, because like you said, baby's going to inherit that microbiome. Yeah. So, I mean, I can just say from a personal perspective, I wish, you know, with my middle son, he has eczema and he has digestive stuff and it's all so obvious that it came from me Yes. with my, and, you know, my first daughter, she's fine. She can, she can eat gluten and she's fine. You know, my second one, he can't. And so it's just very obvious to us to look at like, Oh, the difference in their health is totally reflective of the difference in my health when I conceived. So, um, yeah. So for moms who are, who are for women who want to get pregnant or moms who want to have another baby, um, gut health is, is complicated, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I really kind of, to simplify it, it's like that 4R program, like 
find out what the infection is, remove that, remove any offending foods, which are usually gluten, dairy, sugar, maybe eggs and corn and others, um, and then replace enzymes. So digestive enzymes are so important. Maybe stomach acid has been lost, but all of that to help remove the infections. I mean, some of the really common infections that we see are bacterial overgrowth like SIBO, um, which can influence nutrients as well. You know, So people often have low B12 when they have SIBO. Um, fungal overgrowth or candida overgrowth, which is largely unrecognized in the conventional paradigm. Um, or, you know, there's other kinds of infections with dysbiosis and, you know, dysbiosis is incredibly common, but um, sometimes parasites, you know. So remove and replace. And then I don't often, um, in terms of probiotics, it depends because if you start a probiotic and you feel worse, I mean, you're the expert here, but like you start a probiotic and you feel worse, it's probably because you have bacterial overgrowth or something else going on. So I think we both are fans of megasporobiotic. Um, that is one where I think there's a big question, is this safe to use during pregnancy? I personally think it is, but it hasn't been studied, right? So, um, so probiotics and then and prebiotic type foods are, are great for somebody who doesn't struggle with gut infections. I mean, how to like increase your gut bacteria is just eat a lot of prebiotic foods, eat foods high in probiotics like kimchi and sauerkraut. Um, and then avoidance, right? Like most of it's avoidance of all the junk that we get exposed to, the chemicals. Um, gardening can be great for your gut. Pets can be good for your gut. We're going to get a puppy just for my gut, right? I love it. <laughs> I'm like, yes, okay, I'll get the puppy. It's good for my health. <laughs> for um, so, I mean, there's so much, so many different influences. But one thing I think about too is the hygiene hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And have we ever been more hygienic than now? But the hygiene hypothesis, it's like, it's not good for our gut microbiome. We're like scrubbing everything down. We don't want to touch anything. And while that might be uh, important right now, I think there's also side effects to it. Oh gosh, you brought up so many good points. I would love to comment on like the sport probiotics. They haven't been studying pregnancy. I agree with uh, Christine that the, I definitely do still prescribe them and have patients take them. Um, Bifidobacter tends to be very prevalent in infants. And so if you had a concern about um, probiotics or your baby needs more probiotic, there's bifido strains that are for infants or children that you can get chewable. Or if it's a powder, you can put it in the brother, mother's breast milk or even on the mother's breast so that the baby gets extra probiotic. And of course, if the mom's taking probiotic and breastfeeding, she's going to transfer that in her breast milk. So you don't really need to give the breastfeeding infant extra probiotic if you give it to the mother. Um, but the one thing about the, the soil-based probiotics haven't been studied as well. And I, I feel like there might be a more dangerous zone. The soil-based are not the same as spore. The spore have actually been studied, maybe not in pregnancy, but there's a lot of human studies. So I always lean towards the purely spore probiotics versus the soil-based, especially in pregnancy. And I do find people with SIBO, SIFO, those gut disorders, they tend to do better on the spores than just pure lactobacillus. So often I'll kind of shift that direction for the tough guts. Um, and then let's see, you mentioned, um, you talked about probiotics, gut, preconception, gut health. All these things are so critical. Um, so again, if you're thinking about it, and it's going to affect your life in a good way, no matter what. So treating that gut is really, really core. Awesome. Oh my gosh, this is so fun. Um, let's see, we talked about nutrients. We talked about uh, toxicity. We talked about mold. We talked about breast milk, breast health. What do you recommend for length of breastfeeding? Um, oh. and yeah. Yeah. I think it just depends because as, uh, I mean, I fed my first daughter till she was two and a half mm -hmm. with my son, I had health issues and I stopped when he was 11 months. And then my third, I stopped it at, at when she was 12 months. I mean, I think it would be awesome. Like if women can go till two years, that's amazing. But the thing is, it's really taxing on our bodies and there is already this depleted state for many women. So many women already go into pregnancy, like just at the brink where they're, almost deplete a lot of nutrients and you know we're stressed out to the max and then like we add pregnancy to it and we deplete things a little bit more and then we have a baby and we go through this like very difficult labor that is yeah a labor right it's yeah. like it's an or surgery and then it's like postnatal depletion is a real thing and then you're breastfeeding on top of that and so it's really just about sort of how resilient mom is how much she can take and and just it's such a personal decision you know it's like it's a special bond with your baby and some women can't breastfeed yeah. for women who can't breastfeed. I'm always suggesting like thyroid, let's look at your thyroid really closely, which we can talk about post-conception labs too, because I think those are often um, ignored, but, but anyways, I think postnatal depletion is a really real thing. And I think for me, I couldn't breastfeed past 11 months with my yeah. second one. Like I did everything I could to keep my supply up. 
-hmm. but it was to my own, it was to the detriment of my health. Yeah. So, you know, there's like, right. There's a fine line. It's a, it's a fine line. I love you yeah. bringing that up too. Cause what I see a lot is shaming, right? Shaming of new moms. And there's too much of that because we have this idea that we have to have the perfect career, the perfect baby postpartum. We're supposed to be running, you know, in a few, you know, a few weeks and all this kind of stuff and, or breastfeeding until five years old, like some ridiculous kind of thing. And that is not even based in reality. And so I think if anything, we can give them permission to be yourself. And granted, if it's three months is all you can do and your breath, you know, that that's fine. You're going to give your yeah. baby at least three months. And if it's a year, great. If it's two years, even better, but there's no shame here. And that's really important because so many new moms are totally burdened. They're already, their hormones are out of whack. And we'll talk about that too. But like the postpartum period is such a tough period for so many reasons. How would you support your postpartum moms best? Like what would you yeah. what advice? So I like to give my postpartum moms a lab order and I say at four to six weeks, have somebody come to your house and draw your labs. Perfect. Things might be a little different in the pandemic, but um, I, you know, autoimmunity, as you know, very well is, um, we're at high risk for that postpartum. And we don't necessarily know why. I think there's a lot of different reasons, um, including, you know, having another human's DNA inside of us, yeah. <laughs> you know, but I mean, there's a lot of different theories as to whether it's just a great hormonal shift or whatever it might be or stress because we're not sleeping because we're breastfeeding and we're nutrient depleted and we're not sleeping at night and we're waking up every two hours to breastfeed, whatever. Um, but autoimmunity is a big one and, and thyroid too, you know, so we can postpartum, there's a lot of different things that can happen with our thyroid. Um, postpartum thyroiditis typically doesn't happen at four to six weeks. That's for like four to six months. Um, but it's pretty terrible when it happens, people feel, you know, super anxious and they're like postpartum anxieties are already a real thing. And then you add like hyperthyroidism onto it and then they just crash and they're like super tired and their breast milk sometimes crashes. And, um, so I think it's just important. I think new moms need to know it's not just because you're a new mom all the time. I think that too often their concerns are dismissed as well. You're a new mom. It's, you know, yeah, mm -hmm. it's hard, but it's extra hard if you're have physical struggles, you know, with your health. So, yeah. So the way I support my, my uh, patients postpartum is I give them that lab order. We check their labs four to six weeks and we just try to maintain really good nutrition and really good supplementation just based on you know what they need and of course i always encourage them to get all the help they can get because it's not easy being a new mom right i love that you say that because just to validate you know whether you're going into it you've experienced it um or you never do and you have friends or family who do it's there's a lot of compassion that's needed because i don't envy especially nowadays i mean years ago when the family was all around and they had yeah. all this help the grandmother lived next door they weren't working maybe full time or they were at least were it's just there's so many differences now with the expectations and i think that's just even releasing those expectations it's a hard time and it's okay to get help and it's okay to not be perfect and all all of these yeah. um, so important. Yeah. Um, I'd love to uh, talk about uh, your new company and where people yeah. can find you and what kind of resources you're going to be putting out. Tell us a little bit about this new venture. Yeah. So my new venture is with a very dear friend of mine, Dr. Alex Carrasco. She's in Austin. Um, we used to, you know, we got to know each other in Austin when we were both functional medicine practitioners there. Um, but Alex is also the mom of three and she's an MD, I'm a DO. And so it's called Hey Mommy, M-A-M-I, like the Latina mommy. Yeah. It's kind of like a bit of a pickup term, but like in a sweet way, you know? Um, <laughs> so Hey Mommy is gonna be kind of all things preconception, pregnancy, postpartum and into mommyhood. I mean, postpartum doesn't end at six months or a year, right? Like we're, I'm still postpartum, my baby's two and a half, right? So um, so that, that goes for a while, but we're, we're, our mission is really just to support women in their health during these phases of life and encourage women to um, take care of themselves, you know, for, the, for like a healthier and happier mommyhood is really the idea behind it. So we're um, launching soon. Right now we have some awesome resources. If you go to our website, it's just heymommy.com. And we have a really great nutrition site there. So you can download our like one page nutrition um, tear out sheet, but we're going to have some really awesome definitive guides on there that will walk you through sort of like everything you need to know before you get pregnant or everything you need to know when you're pregnant. Often we find that a lot of the resources um, aimed at people who are trying to get pregnant or are pregnant are really fear-based. Yeah, yeah. And so we're not into that. We're more just in, about empowering women. Like these are the things you can do. 
And I have seen some of your stuff previewed and I, you guys are in for a treat. Like I said at the beginning, I just want to repeat, I actually put the link in. So if you're watching, you can go below and click on that and get your resources and stuff. But stay tuned because this is going to be big. I don't see anyone doing this well. And so I see this as being just a credible resource. And I think it'll really take off because it's a needed thing. And I think whether it's someone like me who needs it for giving to patients or someone who needs it for their daughter or sister, it doesn't mean that everybody's in that conception phase, but everybody knows someone who is. So share that with the people that you love that might be in that phase. Um, very cool. Any last bit of, um, we haven't talked at all about the virus pandemic. People are probably pretty bored about that, but yeah, any, right. right. Um, I'd love to know before we kind of uh, sign off of any, like just personal life lessons or things in this time, it fe feels like a time, at least personally. And for most people I talk to of transition and growth and there's, you know, a lot good going on, a lot bad going on, but what have you, what's been your like takeaway, anything, um, life lessons through this last several months? Yes. And it's not just me. It's a lot of, I work with a lot of moms, you know, and yeah. I, I call a lot of them and they're like, I'm actually kind of happy. Me too. Like, like secret I handshake, mean, right? Like, uh, like I'm, I'm like, secretly enjoying that I'm I don't have really to drop happy. my kid like all over town and go to soccer practice yeah, yeah. and then like run and put something in a crock pot and then right. come back, you know? So, um, cool. so I think the takeaway is really like things aren't going to go back to normal. There's no, they're like, they're not going back to normal, but we have the opportunity to create our new normal. Yeah. And what is that going to look like? I mean, I've tried to really sit down and think about like, what's my new normal going to be? I'm not, how do you, how do you keep yourself from getting back into the same habit of go, 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 rush, 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 mm -hmm. and really sit down and, and quietly enjoy the people around you and not have to drive all over town. I feel like life's more simple, right? We're not getting our nails done and our right. whatever right. done, you know, like there's less, um, this is the first time I've put jeans on and a dress shirt in like three months. You're it. welcome. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> so I, I mean, but it's nice. Shirts, sorry, you know? guys. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Um, I don't, I don't blame you. Um, you know, it's it's kind of nice to just um, let go of some of the expectations and some of the. I think we got a little wrapped up in things. I do too. I could not agree more. And it's funny because I think the majority of people, like I said, it's almost like a secret handshake. Hey, are you okay? You know, yeah. you don't want to be insensitive if someone's suffering. Absolutely. I mean, I know there are people who have loss and are right. suffering. Right. I mean, that's very right. real. Um, but on the other hand, there's a lot of people who have found a new way of life and there's some good things. And I would say the same for me. Um, I traveled all over the place before and I'm like, I like being home. I don't know if I'm going to do that again. I mean, I might do to some extent, but not every weekend. That was too much. And my system is happier. And the other thing that's interesting, you mentioned nails and all that. Well, I had like my massage therapist, my physical therapist, my all these therapies, right? I was like trying to improve myself and make sure that I was healthy and all of that stopped. And I'm like, I'm good. My back's good. Yeah. Good. I'm like, I, I'm fine with that. And I probably like four to five hours a week I would do, whether it was personal counseling, physical therapy, training. I mean, all of these appointments with people to help me. And I'm like, you know what? I'm good. Yeah. And I saved like five hours a week. I know. <laughs> and that's a lot of time. I mean, I yeah. can totally relate to that. And I feel like I'm actually sleeping better, yeah. you know? So yeah. it's like, yeah. huh, interesting. Cool. cool. Well, I guess we've all got like a little reset button. I didn't ask it. for it, but and we got it anyways. The good stuff in. Yeah. Well, it has been so fun to talk to you and I'll make sure that your website, your resources are all linked here. And um, thank you for taking the time today to share. It was so fun. Thank you for having me. It's always fun to talk to you. You're welcome. And I always learn something every single time. So I have like, I should bring a notepad when I talk to Jill. <laughs>